afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the Centre for Comparative Public Law, it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Rebecca Williams to the faculty. Um, Dr. Williams holds an Associate Professorship in Law at the University of Oxford, and she is currently based at Pembroke College. Rebecca was previously a fellow of Robinson College. She did her BCI at Oxford and her PhD at Birmingham University. Rebecca's principal areas uh, of research are public law and public law, and she has published on unjust enrichment and public law, which is a part publication examining unjust enrichment claims involving public authorities in France, England, and the EU. And she's here today to share with us her work on the multiple doctrines of legitimate expectations. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to that. Thank you so much, Peter, for inviting me, and thank you all of you um, for having me here. It's a real honour and pleasure to be here to be able to talk to you. So, as Peter says, what I'm going to talk to you about um, is the doctrine of legitimate expectations, and the appeal of this doctrine to courts is really obvious. It has its origins in concepts like fairness and abuse of power, and that all sounds really good and immediately appealing to courts. Um, but of course, the more courts engage in um, substantive protection of expectations the closer they get to specifying, at the very least, as we might put it, the direction in which a football should be kicked, as Lord Donaldson might put it, rather than just confining themselves to their normal proper role in judicial review, which is that of being a referee. So if they're going to engage in this more substantive kind of review, and this more interventionist kind of review, then it's obvious that we need them to be very clear about what they're doing and about how they're doing it and the circumstances in which that's going to take place. But so far, this has not been true of the doctrine of legitimate expectations, and it hasn't provided that kind of clarity and guidance. So why is it that the law has not yet really been clear? Well, in particular, I'm going to argue that a source of the current uncertainty is the fact that so far, the doctrine of legitimate expectations has been regarded as just that. It's been regarded as a unitary doctrine with various applicable criteria which are universally applicable in all circumstances in the same way when trying to establish a claim. And the difficulty then is that if you try to find the underlying theory for what is actually a very diverse area of cases, then you end up with some very vague and general concepts, so things like abuse of power or fairness. And those criteria and concepts are not then going to be able to provide very specific or detailed guidance to a court in any particular case. It's also assumed, as I said before, that all of the criteria used for establishing a claim are going to apply in the same way in all contexts, regardless of the subject matter. So, for example, we're told that a representational promise must be clear and unequivocal and unqualified in order to found a legitimate expectation. But if you drill down into the case law, what counts as clear and unequivocal and unqualified is very different in different cases, to the point where we had a 3-2 split in the Supreme Court in the Bank Court decision on whether, in fact, the representation was clear enough. And there was no real easy means of deciding between the majority and the minority in that case. So my argument is going to be that what we should do instead is to see the doctrine of legitimate expectations not as just one big whole amorphous blob, but we should try and divide it up and in fact see that it comprises three quite distinct kinds of expectation and that each of these kinds of expectation has a different normative basis. So first of all, I'm going to talk about expectations which are akin to a kind of private law claim, something a bit like contract. Secondly, I will talk about expectations which control the use of policies by public authorities. And the third category I'm going to talk about are called expectations at the moment. But what I'm going to say is that really we will discover they are concerned not really with expectations at all, but with equality and with the idea of treating like cases alike and different cases differently. So I'll go through each of these in turn in order to establish how these different normative bases should then be given a more central role in determining the criteria which are necessary to establish a claim in each of these three quite separate areas. And I'll try and demonstrate that I think it should be these different normative bases that we should be using to structure the area and to structure the doctrine, rather than, as we have in the past, focusing very much, for example, on whether the ultimate remedy is substantive or procedural. That has tended in the past to be the way that we structure the area. And I think, really, we should now be doing it by reference to, well, what is the cause of action? What is the normative basis of the claim? <coughs> 
So I said the first category um, that I would talk about are legitimate expectations as almost contracts. And these kinds of expectations arise where an authority makes a promise in order to induce people to do something they, they don't want to do or they might not initially have been inclined to do, only then to renege on that promise once compliance has been achieved. So probably the most famous English legitimate expectations case falls into this category, and that is the decision in Cochrane, um, as of course does the Hong Kong case in Su Tung. Um, and I'm going to apologise right now for my pronunciation and just ask you to bear with me um, through my talk as I get through that. So in both of these situations, as Lord Wolfe, the Master of the Rolls, put it in Cochrane, the expectation has the character of a contract. So Cochrane concerned Ms. Coughlin, who was a severely physically disabled woman. She was asked to move into a particular care home, Marden House, which she wasn't very inclined to do. And Southampton Area Health Authority said, no, please move into this house. If you do so, it will be your home for life. We won't move you again. And then later on, they discovered that, in fact, it wasn't financially viable to keep Marden House open. By that stage, there were only five or six people living in it. And so they said, well, actually, we did say it was going to be your home for life, but it's not. We need to move you again. And she successfully challenged that decision to close Marden House on the basis that she had a legitimate expectation that it would indeed remain her home for life. Now, Ng Su Tung, as you all know better than I do, concerned applicants for judicial review of the Hong Kong government's interpretation of the right of abode provisions in the basic law. They were all told that they should not bring individual actions because there would be a series of test cases which were brought before the Court of Final Appeal and the Immigration Department would follow the final judgment of the courts on those test cases. The result of those test cases in Chung Lai Wa, um, late, which later became Ka Ling, and Chang Kang Ga, was then adverse to the Immigration Department, and so faced with the idea that suddenly large numbers of people would be claiming the right of abode, the Hong Kong government then, as you know, requested an interpretation of the relevant provisions of basic law from the Standing Committee of the NPC, and when those interpretations were given, they effectively contradicted the findings of the courts. So the initial applicants then brought claims that their legitimate expectations had been thwarted because just like Ms. Coughlin, they had kept their half of the bargain, they hadn't pursued their legal rights in the hope that they would indeed be treated in the same way as the parties to the test cases, only later on to discover that that wouldn't happen um, because the public authority had decided that it was unable to keep its half of the bargain. So as Burroughs has written in the law of contract, generally the law of contract is concerned with binding promises. It's a traditionally accepted feature but that involves bargain promises, i.e. promises supported by consideration. So it's this combination of binding promise, the idea that there's an ex exchange of obligation which is at the heart of contracts. And that's what's special, I think, about this particular category of legitimate expectation cases. In fact, it's not clear to me why, in fact, the Coughlin case was not dealt with as a contractual issue, except possibly purely a matter of chance that she happened to go to a public lawyer for address rather than going to a private lawyer who might well have read her claim as being one in contract. So it may well just be the result of happenstance that it wasn't pursued as a contract claim. But certainly in these cases, it seems to me what they have in common is this idea of an exchange of promises, that the public authority promises the private claimant something in exchange for which the claimant agrees to behave in a way that they would not have behaved otherwise. So the question then is, how do we translate that? If we're going to say, right, this is the normative basis for this first category of claim, how does that then have an impact on what we need in order to make out the claim? How does that, that normative basis feed into the ingredients that we might um, expect the claimant to have to demonstrate if they are going to make out a claim successfully on this basis? Well, one clear conclusion is that if we're saying the essence of this category of expectations is a kind of bargain or an exchange of promises, then that's what we're going to need to find. There must be a clear promise or representation that, as in MFK, the claimant must have put its cards all face up on the table so that everybody is, is bargaining and dealing with each other transparently and openly. And there must be that exchange of promises if you're going to bring your claim in this first category. What about the length of the duration of your expectation? Well, it seems that in this category, that is not going to be so much of a challenge for the claimant. There may be, and we'll talk about this later, situations where that might matter. But here, 
both the rights of abode claimants and Ms Cochrane's claim were for life. They were, they were very long-lasting claims, and that did not seem to stand against successful claimants in both of those two cases. So long temporal duration doesn't seem likely to be an issue here, whereas it might be in some of the other categories we talk about. Now, what about the issue of reliance? Well, at the moment, because we have these homogenous rules for all legitimate expectations cases, the rule is that you don't have to show reliance, but as we know from the BB case, an absence of reliance is going to be, we're told, very much the exception rather than the rule. Well, now we understand the normative reason for upholding expectations in this first category, it seems very odd to say you wouldn't re require knowledge and reliance. Clearly, you would. They would be part of the essence of the claim. The practical difficulty with this, though, is the one which Lord Justice Sheeman identified in Beebe, namely that the, the form of reliance that you're likely to have is very likely to be negative. So in both Coughlin and in Sutun, the claimants have refrained from doing something in reliance on the promise. So how then are they going to prove, well, I would have done something differently in a parallel universe? That's going to be very difficult for them to make out. So if we were to say, right, we're going to require knowledge and reliance as part of the claim, that would pose a real challenge to the claimants. So what I think we should perhaps do instead is say, OK, what we'll do is we will allow the public authority to defeat the claim if it can prove that there positively was not knowledge or reliance. So if there really is some tangible evidence that the claimant did not know of the thing on which they were relying or had not expended anything in reliance on it or changed their position in any way, maybe that should be allowed to defeat the claim, but we won't go so far as actually requiring the claimant to demonstrate that as part of the claim itself. And that conclusion, I think, would be in keeping um, with the decision of Justice Sales in the Oxfam case. So all of, I've been talking about so far are this, is this sort of exchange of bargains, this almost contract kind of situation. That leaves open the question of what should happen if we're dealing with a gratuitous promise of the kind which was at issue in BB. So in BB, a local authority thought it had to provide housing to a particular category of applicants. So it promised them, yes, you know, we will do this, we will get housing for you then discovered that actually they weren't under any such duty to provide housing and so went back on that promise. Well, on the one hand, um, if a gratuitous promise not to expend, pro to expend private money is not enforceable in private law, then it seems very difficult to justify enforcement of a gratuitous promise in public law when it's public resources that are at issue. So you might say, well, a fortiori then in public law, that kind of promise is not going to be enforceable. Conversely, though, in BB, Lord Justice Sheeman took the view that in this respect, the public authorities ought to be held to a higher standard than private entities, not a lower one. So he said, no, there is a legitimate expectation, even though it's only a gratuitous promise. But if you, in fact, look at the role that the legitimate expectations played in BB, it was ultimately minimal. All they said was that the expectation had to be identified as a relevant consideration, which must be taken into account by the decision maker. There was no requirement that the decision maker actually do anything with it except to take it into account. And arguably, if you haven't got a true bargain, a true exchange of promises, and it is only a gratuitous promise, then that does seem the most that should happen. Now, as for the number of applicants that are involved, although the court in Cochrane did emphasise the fact that there are only a very few claimants, five or six, in that case, in fact, if we're seeing these claims in, in almost contract terms, we know from Carlisle and Carbolic Smokeball that it is possible to make an offer to the world at large. So there's no inherent reason why it has to be a small category of claimants. Of course, as public authorities are not private companies, and the size of class obviously is going to matter because it's going to have different implications for the public purse. The smaller the number of claimants, the smaller the impact on the public purse, and therefore the more likely the court will uphold the claim. But courts should bear in mind in making that kind of assessment that although it feels in the short term like thwarting the expectation will help the public authority because there won't be these burdens on public resources of whatever kind, in the long run, they have to remember that actually the authority's ability to manage and govern is going to be correspondingly reduced if everybody knows that its statements and its promises can't be relied on. That actually might feel like a short-term gain for the public authority, but it might be a long-term loss, and the court should be bearing that in mind as well when it's making this kind of assessment and balance. In terms of the appropriate response you might expect for these expectations, well, against this almost contractual background, it seems a lot less surprising that we're generally talking about substantive upholding of the expectations in these cases. 
But of course, even actual contract law doesn't re regard specific performance as the principal remedy. So this may be the sort of area where now that we understand properly what's going on and we understand that they are akin to contracts, maybe this would be an area where developing some kind of expectation damage remedy might be an option for the future. Of course, that also raises the much more vexed question, which I haven't got time to talk about today, about the precise relationship between an almost contract in public law and an actual contract in private law and how that sort of public-private interface works and that much more difficult question um, of the relationship between public and private law more generally. So finally, if we understand the nature of cases like Hoffman and Unsutung better, then I think that also increases the chances of the law providing some helpful guidance to decision makers. It's always difficult without any specific empirical evidence to say, yes, if the courts are clearer, this will provide better guidance, that will be better um, for administrative behaviour. But in the written version of my paper, I look at the work of people who have done empirical work, like um, Morris Sunkin and others, and I conclude that if admin law is going to have any hope at all of exerting this kind of influence on decision makers, it can only do that if it's going to send a clear and consistent and comprehensible message to decision makers. Taken alone, the Cochrane decision looks very much like the court kicking the football instead of being a referee. And it's not clear what the implications of Cochrane are, how far it extends, when you would have a similar claim, when you wouldn't, and so on. But if we, if we say, well, instead, what's happening here is that the courts are upholding an almost contract to sort of the bargain, then it becomes a lot less problematic, because what the court would then be doing, if it sends that much clearer signal, is clarifying a choice for the public authority. On the one hand, do you want to make this promise? If you do, you will be bound by it. So think very carefully. Do you want to enter that sort of almost contract in the first place? If you do, fine, but then you'll be held to the other half of the bargain. If you don't, then fine, but you won't get what it is that you're asking for now. So it's really a question of the courts clarifying that choice for the public authority, rather than, as at the moment, not leaving the authority with any particularly clear guidance as to what its choices are. Okay, so that's the first category, which is where I think the business expectations act in a way which is kind of akin to contract. The second kind of expectations, I think, which some cases um, raise, are different from those that I've looked at so far. These, these cases are much more specific to public law. They're much less like any form of private law, and I think they're part of admin law's much more general control of, admit, of authorities' use of policy, which we've seen more generally in cases like Purdy and British Oxygen. And I think this category um, of policy management legitimate expectations can be subdivided into two further subcategories. Some are just more generally aimed at enforcing good rule-based management. If you have rules or policies, how do you manage those properly and use them properly? And the second subcategory is those which are about changing policy. So if you want to move from policy A to policy B, how do you do that effectively and fairly? Now, of course, it's always controversial to suggest that there should ever be a substantive legitimate expectation based on just a policy or practice rather than a promise by the authority. And again, I've tried in my written paper to answer the objections of various commentators like Clayton who suggested that there perhaps shouldn't be one at all in these circumstances. Crucially, a key point to make is that there's no question in this context of the law of legitimate expectations saying there must be a policy. That choice is entirely for the public authority. The point is, if a public authority has decided for its own reasons to adopt and publish some kind of policy or practice, then the courts will become engaged in controlling the use of that policy subsequently. And again, that may feel as if it's the courts restraining the decision maker and as if it's somehow the courts acting against the interests of the decision maker. But in fact, it may also be a benefit to the public authority because an applicant who knows the rules and knows that they will be enforced is more likely to be able to play by those rules. That, in turn, will help the efficiency of the de dealing with their application as it moves through the system. And it may well have been those kinds of concerns of efficiency and straightforwardness which were behind the public authority deciding to adopt the policy in the first place. So again, if a court upholds a policy in these circumstances, it's not necessarily antithetical to the interests of the public authority in doing that. So the first um, subcategory that I mentioned is the expectations that the rules will apply or will not apply or will be operated in a particular way. So to give you some examples of this, in Unilever, um, the Inland Revenue chose over a 25-year period not to enforce a two-year time limit for claims relating to corporation tax. So for 
a long time, 25 year period, it was possible to bring claims and they weren't very careful about when those claims were brought relative to when the claim arose. And then suddenly, the Inland Revenue decided it was going to impose that time limit and it was suddenly going to start rejecting claims as being out of time, even though for 25 years it hadn't done that. And the court therefore held that it would be unfair and an abuse of power for the revenue to basically take a windfall tax by suddenly relying on the time limit when for years and years it had acquiesced in the breach of the time limit. So that's a case where there was an expectation which had developed that the rules wouldn't be applied. Conversely, both the cases of Kahn and Davidson against Cooper concerned situations in which claimants had relied on one set of published guidelines and brought their claim within the set of guidelines they thought would be applied to their case, only to be told, no, in fact, a completely different set of guidelines is going to be applied to your case, and they hadn't been aware of those guidelines previously. They hadn't been the published ones. In Khan's case, um, the situation concerned immigration, and the expectation was upheld. Gaines Cooper was another tax case, and the expectation was not upheld in Gaines Cooper. So again, if we're going to say that um, now that we've understood the basis for this kind of legitimate expectation, that should then feed into the ingredients for the claim, how does our understanding that this is about helping public authorities manage their policies, how does that have an impact on the ingredients which you would expect a claimant to make out in order to be able to bring a claim in this category? Well, again, first of all, there must be some kind of reasonably clear form of published rules or policy, some kind of clear practice. As the Unilever case demonstrates, if the expectation is reasonably long-standing, that's also going to help the claim the longer it's been going on, the higher the chances um, that the claimant will be allowed to rely on it. More significant is the requirement that the expectation be devoid of relevant qualification. And probably the only distinguishing feature between Gaines Cooper, where the claimants failed, and Kahn, in which the claimants succeeded, is the fact that in Gaines Cooper, there was a sort of what they called a health warning put into the tax guidance, which said, by the way, don't rely on any of this. You probably won't be able to enforce it. So that kind of health warning was probably the only reason that you can explain Gaines Cooper having not been upheld when Kahn was. And so it seems very likely now that the courts have told authorities that this kind of health warning works, that we will see more public authorities including those kinds of health warnings in their documents in future. And then that will mean that when the claimant comes to court, the court will say, no, sorry, that's not devoid of relevant qualification. But as before, we should note that that kind of defensive approach by public authorities may be much more problematic as a thing to adopt if the public authority actually wants the public to engage with a particular policy. So if, for example, you are trying to increase the use of public transport in a particular area and you say, right, we will give you reduced <coughs> bus passes or you know, parking outside the city limits or whatever it might be, but by the way, we aren't necessarily going to do that, so please invest $100 on, in your card, but actually it might not be worth the paper it's written on. It's going to be a lot harder to get people to engage with that kind of policy. So if it's a policy that the public authority actually wants people to, to choose to engage with, then covering it in health warnings may not be the best move. Even if it's a policy that the public has no choice whether to engage with or not, if there is a health warning, a well-advised member of the public is much more likely to contact the public authority for specific guidance. Look, I know it says in your document in this tax case in Gaines Cooper that there's a health warning and I can't rely on this. So can I talk to you particularly about my case and can I have some sort of spe specific guidance from the Inland Revenue signed and dated that says that I can rely on it and I can conduct my affairs in a particular way. So I don't know whether the Revenue have planned to open up a large number of phone banks and have people sitting there manning the phones right after Davis and Gaines Cooper, but it would have been a good move because that's the obvious advice that the court is giving to tax advisors is get in touch with the Inland Revenue directly. Don't just rely on any generalised guidance or policy that it's published because that's not reliable. So if that's what the Inland Revenue wants, great. If it's not what it wanted, then actually Gaines Cooper looks like a win for the revenue, but may in the long run not be quite such a win. As before, um, now that we understand the basis for this kind of expectation, reliance and knowledge are going to be key um, in conceptual terms, but again, for practical reasons, better to make the defendant succeed if it can prove absence of reliance and knowledge rather than proving positive reliance or knowledge by the claimant, although it is more likely that that could be made out in these kinds of cases. The number of people affected is going to have public purse implications um, as before, so for pragmatic reasons that's going to be significant. 
Um, but equally, arguably, the greater the number of people affected, the greater the incentive for the courts to ensure that the policy is operated properly and effectively. So again, the arguments are not going to be all one way. Um, and again, if we clarify the law as I've tried to do here, then I think again that has the potential to be a benefit, not just to private claimants, but also to public authorities. It clarifies the choice available to them. Do you want to act defensively and publish a health warning? saying that your rules can't be relied on, but of course, bear in mind, if you do that, then people won't rely on them, which if you want them to is a disadvantage, or they may contact you for individualised assurances and references, and so are you sure you want the kind of individualised contact that that will incite? Alternatively, if you want the policy to stand alone and obviate that need for contact, then you can do that, and that will improve efficiency, but of course, you will then be bound by the policy that you've published, so be really clear about what goes into that policy and draft it really carefully. So again, by, by clarifying what the basis for the expectation is and what the ingredients for it are, arguably the courts can send a lot more helpful guidelines to the public authority in terms of what the choices are which are available to it. Okay, so that's the first um, subdivision of policy-based expectations where it's just about managing the set of rules that, that the public authority has in place. That then gets us onto the question of what happens if the public authority wants to change a policy or wants to reserve for itself the possibility of changing from one policy to another. Well, the argument here is that legitimate expectations can operate as a kind of court-ordered transitional provision something which will balance the need for changing the policy against the impact that it will have on those who are still in the pipeline. And one of the best examples I found of this kind of case is a decision um, called Patel. Dr Patel contacted the General Medical Council in the UK to inquire whether a particular medical degree he planned to obtain overseas would qualify him as a, as a doctor in the UK. He wanted to carry on practising as a pharmacist. He couldn't do a full-time degree, so he found a, a foreign degree he could do, which was part-time and by correspondence. And he said, if I do this, will that be OK? Can I qualify as a doctor? And the GMC assured him that it would, and that he had emails from the GMC saying, yes, this would be absolutely fine. Dr Patel then invested a considerable amount of time, effort and money in getting the degree, only to discover that in the interim the GMC had changed its rules and said, oh no, sorry, that degree no longer qualifies you. Yeah, we know we said it did, but actually now it doesn't. The Court of Appeal held that not only should the GMC have taken account of Dr Patel's legitimate expectation that his qualification would be valid in the UK, but they further went on to say it was not open to the GMC to change its policy without adopting some transitional provision that would cater for this case of applicant. It would not be appropriate, the court said, for it to identify what those transitional provisions should have been, but it said to the GMC, you go back and you create them, and in the meantime, grant specific relief to Dr Patel and recognise his qualification like you promised you would. So again, in terms of what ingredients we might expect now from, for, for such a claim to be made out, now that we understand the basis for the claim, there's no reason why we would require a specific representation rather than any kind of generalised policy. But of course, as the Patel case demonstrates, the more specific the promise was that was made to you, the more that's going to support your case. So it clearly will increase your chances of success, but it's not necessary. A general representation should, in theory, be sufficient. Size of class may be important here for pragmatic reasons like it was in the other categories, but this time we've also got a more subtle distinction to be drawn between finite and infinite classes. So was the class of people in the pipeline finite, i.e. relatively visible to the decision maker when they were thinking about changing their policy, or was it just infinite and there was no way of knowing who was in the pipeline? And this is something which has been um, looked at in EU cases like Sovereign Port and Unifruit Hellas. If the claimant is part of a finite class, that makes them more visible in the pipeline. And so the argument that, it, that the authority should make provision for them in changing policy is stronger. The more visible they are, the more the public authority is aware of them in the pipeline, the more unfair or wrong it is of the authority just to try and change policy without making provisions for those people caught in the pipeline. Um, by contrast with the almost contract category where we saw Ms Coughlin and the right of abode claimants in Su Tung had expectations which were going to last for life, this time the whole essence of the expectation is that it will only last for a very finite period of time. Look, just give me six months and I will have washed through the system and you can bring the new policy on stream behind me. So inevitably part of the claim is going to have to be the argument that actually this particular claimant will wash through 
pipeline very quickly. If this particular claimant is not going to wash through the pipeline forever, it's going to be much harder for them to claim that there should be some kind of provision to allow them to do that. And so long temporal duration this time, unlike the first category, is very likely to defeat the claim. As before, um, detrimental reliance, clearly now that we understand the basis of this claim, detrimental reliance ought to be required, but as before, let's say burden of proof on the authority to defeat the claim for those practical reasons. Another thing which particularly the EU court has looked at in cases like Sovereign Port is that it, there must be no reasonable provision that the claimant could have made to protect itself. That's something which there were also echoes of in the British MLK case. So if you know you're in the, the pipeline, you can't be completely helpless in expecting the public authority to look after you. You have to do what you can to look after yourself, and then you can expect the public authority to take care of you as well. But of course, let's be realistic about what private claimants can do in order to protect themselves. And finally, um, as demonstrated in Patel, the claimant must have put all their cards face up on the table, like an MFK, so that they are clearly visible in the pipeline, so that the decision maker really can be expected to know that they're there and make provision for them. So again, now that we know the basis and now that we have a better understanding of the ingredients, it's going to be a lot clearer to the public authority what the court is saying and what its options are. Nobody is saying that public authorities can't, be checked, can't change policy at all. It's just that we're going to say it's rare for them to need to do so without putting in place some kind of transitional provision or some kind of health warning with the relative pros and cons of health warnings, which I talked about before. If those provisions are already in place, then as the Luton and Hamble Fisheries cases show, the courts will check them, but the claim is much less likely to, see, to succeed if some provision has been made than it will in a case where Patel, where absolutely no provision has been made at all. So if you are a public authority and you put in place some of your own transitional provisions, the court is much less likely to uphold the claim than it is if you put in place absolutely nothing at all. So that's a clear incentive, yes. So is a provision sort of equal to uh, consideration, that the consideration has been served, therefore the application provision shall work? So basically, yeah, it's sort of saying, okay, we want to change, so we've, we've got some particular licensing rule, and we've published this licensing rule, and we, we know that there's, you know, 5,000 claims in the system which have come through under that licensing rule. So in, in um, Unifruit, Hellas and Sovereign Port, it was about importers who'd shipped goods. They were told there was one lot of import licenses which they had to get. They got the licenses and they shipped the goods. It was known then how many goods were in transit and how many people were in that category of, of, of importers who had goods in transit. The EU then wanted to change its regulations and bring a new set of regulations on stream. But the point was, well, you have to let those people wash through the system. You know there's a finite group of them. You know however many thousands of importers this is going to affect. So the old licences cover those importers, and only after them can you bring the new provisions on stream behind them. So you put something in place that says, we are going to bring in place new regulations, but they will only kick in for anybody who enters the pipeline from now onwards. Anybody already in the pipeline washes through mm -hmm. under the old system. And if, so in Hamble Fisheries, they had put in place a set of trend, uh, transitional provisions about shipping licences. Mr Hamble was just unlucky, he fell outside them and the court said, well tough, you haven't got a claim. So the very fact that there were some provisions made it much more likely that the public authority would succeed and he, his claim would fail. Whereas if they've just not made any effort at all and they just literally pull the rug out from under your feet like they do in Patel, the court's much, much less likely to be sympathetic to that and will say, no, you should have done that, you should have really something. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the final um, kind of, trend, of legitimate expectation that I want to talk about are very different, actually, from the two categories and subcategories that I've talked about so far. They have so far been grouped under the legitimate expectations heading, but actually when you analyse what's going on in these cases, they're not really about certainty or you've pulled the rug out from under my feet or I thought a certain set of things would happen and now they aren't. They're much more cases where the claimant goes through the system and then says, hang on, why did everybody else in my position get this rule applied to them and I didn't? Why have I been treated differently from everybody else? So they may well not have known as they went through the system that this provision was in place, but having been through the system, they then discover that they've been treated unequally or differently from everybody else. So they are about consistency, but they're about consistency across cases rather than being consistent across time. And cases in this category are cases like Nadaraja Abdi and Rashid. And as I say, they may look, in fact, on the facts, very different from a lot of the cases we've looked at so far. 
So that is going to have an impact on the ingredients of such a claim, and the ingredients are going to be very different in this kind of case. So first of all, we can scrap knowledge and reliance. So far we've been saying, well, conceptually they are relevant practicalities of proof. Yes, maybe we'll put burden on the public authority, but it's always been central to the essence of the claims we've been talking about so far. Suddenly, those two ideas of knowledge and reliance are not necessary and not inherent in the claim. It doesn't matter whether you knew of the rules or not as you went through the system. The point is they haven't been applied to you like they were to everybody else. So that's the essence of your claim is I've been treated unequally or inconsistently, not differently from how I expected. Size of class is also going to be different. So far it's been an advantage to be in a small class Maybe for, for conceptual reasons, like in the last category, being a part of a finite class was good, but even in, even in an almost contract case, being a part of a finite class is going to be helpful for, for public purse and financial burdens and pragmatic reasons. Whereas suddenly here, you're going to be arguing, I'm not part of a small and individual class that deserves to be treated differently. I'm just the same as everybody else. And there's a huge class of people, and they've all got this thing, and I haven't. And so I'm just the same as them, and I'm part of a much bigger class of people, all of whom have had whatever benefit or whatever rule it is that the claimants are seeking to have applied to them. These kinds of expectations are also, by definition, much less likely to arise from any kind of individualised dealings between the authority and the claimant, they're much more likely to arise from some kind of general published rules or policy or practice um, aimed at the world at large rather than any individual dealings. And again, once we understand that properly and once we understand what's really going on in this category, instead of shoving these cases in with all of the others and saying, right, they're just this big amorphous blob of legitimate expectations, we're now able to say, no, here's another set of specific guidance we can give to public authorities. What we're saying is make sure that you do treat like cases alike and different cases differently. And if you have treated everybody else in a similar position under these rules, then you have to treat this case the same, unless you want to change policy, in which case see the rules that we were talking about a moment ago. So again, we're providing much more specific guidance now to public authorities. So the conclusion then is that in the past, the doctrine of expectations has been driven much more by the remedies available. Um, is this you know, a procedural or substantive case? And so much less attention has been given to the ingredients of the cause of action. And as I say, they've just been dealt with as one big category rather than being subdivided. And I think the time has now come where we can recognise that in fact there are these three different varieties of expectation. And the normative basis for upholding each of them ought then to feed into the... Um, the ingredients of the claim in each case. Now, one objection you might have to that kind of approach is, well, then you're going to end up with litigation over, is it in category one or is it in category two and so on, and is that going to lead to litigation over the specificity? I don't think that is a big concern for three reasons. Firstly, once we understand the normative basis for the cases, you can tell them apart. You can tell whether the problem is I had a bargain with you which you reneged on or I was in the pipeline and you're trying to change your rules, or I didn't know anything, but actually it turns out I've been treated differently from all of them. You can tell the difference between those in terms of the facts. Secondly, and connected to that, all we're doing is saying, let's make sure the court understands properly the factual basis for the claim, and let's have that feed into the normative basis and the ingredients for the claim. That, again, doesn't seem wildly concerning if we say, well, the courts should understand what's going on better and should do a better analysis of what it's trying to do. That doesn't seem too controversial. And thirdly, of course, courts are already trying to draw these kinds of distinctions. So they do treat BB, which is a gratuitous promise, differently from Cochrane, which is a bargain promise. There is already that difference going on. It's just that at the moment, the courts haven't got the means to articulate it properly or the structure um, to articulate it around. Conversely, I think the approach that I've outlined has a lot of practical benefits. A clearer understanding of the doctrines and their purposes might help the courts to do three things. Firstly, to ascertain what criteria you should require for a successful claim. So at the moment, we're just trying to fit all the pegs of whatever size and shape into the same hole, and so the hole ends up being shapeless. What we're trying to do now is tailor consideration of the ingredients necessary to the particular normative reason for upholding the expectation. So I said long duration, not a problem for the Coughlin and Su Tung people, much more of a problem for the pipeline people. So now we're going to apply that ingredient differently based on which heading we're operating under. Knowledge and reliance really central, at least in conceptual terms, to the first couple of categories I talked about, um, but not for somebody who's basing their claim on the third category of equality and so on. So the way that we apply those ingredients is going to change. And um, finally, if administrative law can provide any guidance to administrators, then it has to be clear. 
And if clarified as suggested here, the law of legitimate expectations, I think, could provide that kind of guidance to decision makers about their use of promises and policies and rules, in particular the benefits but also the obligations associated with their use. Think very carefully, do you want to make this promise to this person? If you do, you'll be held to it, so think very carefully before you enter it. Do you want to put a health warning in? Be aware that there are disadvantages to doing that. Maybe you do, maybe you don't want to put a health warning in. You want to leave the policy on its own, but then put in place transitional provisions when you want to change it, and so on. So the guidance that we're giving to decision makers is a lot clearer. Finally, I think this approach can also help courts to balance the short-term expediencies of thwarting expectations in a particular case against the long-term implications of doing so. So I said before, it feels as if thwarting the expectation and upholding the public authorities claim, or, or not upholding the claim of the claimant and, and supporting the public authority feels like a win for the public authority, but actually in the long run it might not be such a win when that public authority then discovers that actually nobody will rely on its statements anymore, when the inland revenue discovers that instead of publishing generalised tax guidance, which is quite simple, it has to take a million phone calls from a million different tax advisors who all want individualised assurances, then that might not feel like quite such a win in the long run. And so understanding that properly will help courts to do the balancing process properly and not just assume win for the public authority is a win for the public authority, but realise that there may be two sides to that. All these changes, I think, would improve not only the coherence of legitimate expectations as a legal doctrine, but I think it could also then provide practical benefits for both claimants and public authorities involved in the claims. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for that. I'm sure we have uh, plenty of questions, so we have a good uh, 15 minutes or so for questions. You're most welcome. It might help if you just briefly uh, introduce yourself and then ask your question. Uh, Benny Tai, uh, 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 Associate Professor here teaching Administrative Law. I find it very interesting about your categorization of the uh, legitimate expectation. I think that provides a clear idea of the different kinds of legitimate expectations. Uh, but my point is that uh, would that be would it be possible that the three categories may happen in the same case? Take the example of Monsieur Tong, that uh, the specific representations by the legal department and the immigration department to the specific group of representatives, you may take it more like your almost contract, mm -hmm. but the representation made by the chief executive and the secretary for uh, security making uh, through TV, TV messages, that might be more like a equality cases. Yeah. And maybe also the, the, the situation might be quite complicated because the original policy of the government was not to grant the, the rubber bowl to the mainland children, but then the court of final decision overruled that, and then have the standing committee decision and overrule this court of final appeal decision. So the policy was actually transitional and transitional yeah. and transitional. Yeah. So that might be kind of a, a situation that you might have a uh, 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 expectation of three kinds in the same case. So how would that, the, the, the categorizations help in resolving the, the issues in such kind of cases? Well, I mean, I think there's, so there's two ways in which that could arise. I think what you just des described, it, you wouldn't have more than one kind of claim arising in respect of one kind of claimant. So it may well be that what you do is exactly that. You say, right, this tranche of claimants, they all fall under this category. This tranche of claimants, they all fall under a slightly different category. And so for each individual claimant, there is only one basis of claim. But across the very large okay, numbers of claimants yeah. you have across those, then you may well find more than one running at the mm. same time. And that might well be the case that in a, in a big and complex, as you say, policy situation, you may well have more than one of them arising. It is possible that also that it might not initially be clear to the court which category a claimant falls into, but that's exactly the kind of thing, once you understand there are more than mm. one category and you need to know which, that's exactly the sort of thing you would then drill down into in trying to figure out what the facts were. Instead of asking general questions like, does this seem like a generalised policy? Does this seem like a, a sufficiently clear policy? We don't really know what that means or what it requires. you then got a much more structured set of criteria to say, right, if your claim is that you are an almost contract category, we need to see these things from you. If your claim is that you are a transitional provisions category, then we need to see these kinds of things from you. So in each case, it, it's giving much more guidance to counsel about what the evidence is they have to present if they want to bring themselves 
yourself into whichever of those categories it is. And you might well have counsel saying, right, argument number one is that we're an almost contract case, here's our evidence for that. If that fails, we would say that at least we are in this category, and here's our evidence for that. And I think, so you're right, in either case, either, either for any individual claimant or across a whole lot of claimants, you might have more than one category running. But either way, I think it's still probably helpful to know what the, the terms of each of the different claims are so that they can be brought clearly and the court can handle them. Well, you may be right that I think that may explain why the majority was wrong in Im Siu Tong. Yeah. Because that <laughs> they've mixed it up. Yeah. That they take the general representation as if it's like an almost contract yeah. type situation. Yeah. There should be equality. Exactly. And the carry is right. Exactly. I okay. think that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, why did you have a question? Well, I do have one uh, as PY Law uh, tutor in the Ministry of Law uh, in this university. Um, uh, my question is about something that you haven't uh, talked about, uh, which is which goes under the label of uh, rigid expectation, but uh, comes from ratification of human rights treaties. Um, yeah. So uh, my question, therefore, is about uh, how does the ratification of international human rights treaty uh, come? into all these categories. So, if I'm right, but maybe one of the cases you're thinking of is TO, um, and I mm. see TO as one of the equality yeah. cases for exactly that reason. So you have this split in TO as to whether you need knowledge and reliance, and of course this is one of the problems we've had, is that there is a case where clearly you don't need knowledge and reliance. So our courts across all legitimate expectation cases have said, oh, well, we think it would be the exception rather than the rule. Then again, we can't say you always need it. That's because they haven't understood that actually there's, there's different kinds of claims going on. And sometimes it's perfectly fine to say you need knowledge or reliance, or at least proof of absence will defeat the claim. But in other circumstances, when you're talking about an equality case, which is where I'd put Tio, then you don't need to prove knowledge or reliance at all. So the claim there is, well, I haven't been treated in the same way as I should have been because everybody else in my situation was treated like that. And then the argument is going to be much more to do with, well, are you the same as everybody else? Are there any distinguishing features which justify different treatments and so on? The, the whole basis for the claim and the argument is going to be very different, I think. So that's, that's where I would put those. If there's no others, then I'll play the role of a double advocate. <laughs> that, especially on your on the uh, uh, transitional category, the ideas you put forward would that actually transform to the expectation back to procedural protection only? Because actually, what you are saying that okay, for the administrative bodies, if you want to make a a, a, uh, or you want to change your policy, you can put up all these things, and that will be yeah. fair for you to do so. Yeah. So actually, that will be a retreat from yeah. the advancement we have of SLE, and now you are yeah. just getting back to PLE. Yeah, I see what you mean. I mean, it, it's slightly more than, it, they're sort of half between the two. They are more than PLEs because they're not just saying you have to listen to these people before you change policy. They are saying, for example, you have to let Mr. Patel through because Dr. Patel through because you said you would. You can only change, so he gets his substantive expectation and anybody else in his circumstance gets his substantive expectation. But you're right in the sense that I, I still have misgivings about Mr. Hamble. I feel really sorry for him because yeah. you know basically there are a set of transitional provisions and he doesn't get covered by them and you sort of think he should have been really. So what do you do? And that, that is the question. What do you do with insufficient transitional provisions? And the same mm -hmm. goes for Luton and some of the other cases where there have been provisions but they mm -hmm. just weren't very acceptable. At the moment, the courts are buying them and they're saying as long as you've done something, you're right and that is a retreat to some extent. We won't do anything else. We will be satisfied with the fact that you've made some effort. We're not going to look too carefully at how much effort you've made. It is, it is possible in the future as they really understand what's going on and they really understand that, that they would require these provisions if they weren't there, that they you might be able to persuade the courts to go a little bit further and be a little bit harsher about their reading of any existing ones. At the moment, it's a pretty binary thing. You've got them, you'll win. You haven't got them, you'll lose. And we won't really look too carefully at what you've got. But if we really understood this category properly, and there are lots of cases where the court has said in their absence will require you to create them, would that then give them the courage in other cases to say, and actually not just to create them, but to create them properly, and we'll really check that as well. And that, that might be a stage of future development. You're right at the moment, it, it is a bit of a it is a bit more conservative approach than you get in some of the other cases. Yeah, so to, on that point, I may disagree with your approach then, because I'm expecting, or actually maybe in the context of Hong Kong, that will expect that the court will use a more substantive ground to review, like proportionality, 
in reviewing administrative decision, that might be justified under the Hong Kong context. It may yeah. not be justified in other contexts, but at least I would say it, it will be justified. But your approach will actually put forward some kind of barriers to that further advancement of substantive review by the court, uh, even though I think uh, proportionality is not really that substantial, but it is more substantial than when it's really unreasonable, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, but it's, it's possible that you could, you could do that as a sort of two-pronged approach. You could say, right, the first mm -hmm. thing is that the hurdle is that there must be some transitional provisions. Okay. So the next question is, are those transitional provisions suitable, necessary, and you know, a fair balance? Mm -hmm. And maybe mm -hmm. they're not. Maybe they fail on one of those grounds. Mm -hmm. But we've at least we've understood that that's what we're okay. looking at. So maybe maybe it opens the door to more of those claims yeah. as well. Yeah. I don't but, know. But unlikely that the court will advance that two steps. That they, yeah, once they have this step, exactly. they will think, okay, we will set aside with this and wait for ten or twenty maybe, years maybe and see what happens, and before we will move on to. Proportionality. Yeah, maybe yeah. that's right. Maybe that's right. I suppose my hope is that if, if in places where the, the provisions are not in place, the mm. courts get more used to requiring them, will that make them feel that they have more expertise about what such transitional provisions yeah. ought to entail? And then when they get a bunch which don't match up to yeah. their expectations, they might be more like, I don't know, I don't know, it's a, it's a complete conjecture. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Patrick Wen, I'm a part time young student. And just want to uh, talk about the uh, equality principle uh, under the heading three. Yeah. Actually, it seems to me that actually you might have defined it, this term widely, very widely and broadly. Because as far as I can understand, what you said is something like uh, treat like cases alike. Yeah. It's direct discrimination situation. Yeah. But I don't know whether that kind of principle uh, can appropriately cover the situation of indirect discrimination and whether this kind of uh, definition would cover the uh, situation where the uh, ground for discrimination is some kind of uh, characters which is not uh, immutable characters. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I, mean, I think those are all really interesting questions. You know, it, it's sort of a similar answer to the one I gave just now, which is that we aren't even at the stage of being able to ask those questions yet because we haven't even clarified yet that, that that's what's going on in these cases. So again, just as once we've opened the door to understanding what we're doing with transitional provisions, where can we go from there? The same question would apply here. Once we've understood that there is a category of expectations, at the moment we're still at this phase of shoving them in with all the others and trying to see that the claimant has somehow expected something which plainly they haven't. Let's get through the first stage saying, right, that, that, that's not what's going on. These cases are about equality. Now that we know that's what they're about, we can really have a conversation about, well, okay, what is equality? Is that just direct discrimination? Is it indirect discrimination as well? As you say, is it only permanent? Is it immutable? I mean, I think there's no reason inherently why either of those shouldn't be included. There's no reason why equality in treating like cases alike shouldn't mean including cases where there's indirect rather than direct and cases where it's a temporary difference of treatment rather than a permanent one. I can't see any a priori reason why either of those would be excluded, but that's exactly the sort of question we'd be able to ask and we'd be able to discuss openly if we could at least get to the stage of saying these cases are about equality at all, whereas at the moment we're still at a phase of saying that they're actually about expectations and isn't it a bit odd that they don't have knowledge or reliance on, well, they must just be odd cases then, and we, we haven't even got that As far well as I can uh, understand, uh, in, this, in that kind of situation, for example, in the case of immutable non-immutable character and uh, indirect discrimination, the government can, may have a stronger argument to oppose because possibly. the court should not intervene yep. the management or the policy of the government. Yeah, that's yeah. possible. That is, you, it might be possible. I mean, again, in a sense, just as once we've identified almost contracts as being almost contracts, and we said, isn't it a bit odd that Coughlin wasn't a contract case? So how does that deal with the, the relationship between this area and this doctrine? and the area of private law, it, we're sort of getting to the same territory here where we're saying, okay, so we've worked out that there is an area of legitimate expectations which is based on equality. So now what we've got to try and do is, is figure out how that connects to our more general understanding of discrimination and the other sources of anti-discrimination rules that we may have and how does it how does it lock into those. So again, freeing it from, from the sort of heading it's under at the moment lets us look at how it might fit with another another piece of law and another area. Jonathan, uh, BBA law student. Uh, I have a question related to relief. Uh, the Hong Kong Court of Appeal uh, deal with the situation in Tong that they remit the decision back to the uh, authority to yeah. take into account the expectation. So do you think that this is a sufficient relief provided or the court should grant uh, substantive relief 
and will the, your answer be different across different categories that you have identified? I think it would be different across different categories. I think if you're in an almost contract case, and it's a, it's a proper bargain, not just a gratuitous promise like the BB case, where again, that was what the court did. They said, just go back and look at it again and take this into account as a relevant consideration. But if you're not talking about a gratuitous promise, you are talking about one of these bargain promises, then you're claiming for something beyond that. And your claim for a, a full substantive protection, Coughlin and, and Institute and Style, might well be might well be something that you would be entitled to, and that might well not be a sufficient remedy in those circumstances. And again, part of what I'm trying to say is let's not be quite so scared of Cochrane, because Cochrane was an incredibly controversial case in the UK because there was such substantive protection. And, you know, well, you can't just do this. As I say, it is kicking the football. This is terribly controversial. Well, not if you see what was really going on. If you, if you understand that, it, that there was a lot involved in the claim and that there was really a bargain promise there, it becomes a lot less scary that it's being upheld. You would you would worry about upholding it to quite that extent in a gratuitous promise BB kind of situation, I think. And so part of it is about saying you don't need to be afraid of substantive protection where that's really justified. And it, it doesn't mean you're going to get substantive protection across the board, and don't let anybody worry about that. But there are some cases where that level of substantive protection is necessary. The other point to make is that that, that remedy of, of BB and sending it back as a relevant consideration will in any case only work where they haven't even thought of it. If the decision maker has already gone through the process of thinking about the expectation and said, well, I don't care, there's no point in the court sending it back to them to be thought about because they've already been through that hoop already. So it, the BB answer will only ever be an answer where it hasn't even turned its mind to the issue of an expectation. And even then, it will only really be appropriate in much weaker cases like BB, I think. Time for one more question. Anyone? Students? Well, I think you very clearly elucidated the concept as it's presented in various decisions, and um, you've articulated such an attractive scheme uh, that we're still sort of thinking about, you know, the core ingredients and which cases they apply and not. Um, and as Hong Kong courts think about, you know, the direction of our football and where it should go, uh, I think you've given us a great deal of um, uh, material to sort of work with, um, so that we can. And I think, you know, the question and answers in this group, uh, quite importantly, but this is the beginning of the conversation. And hopefully, once we get past stage one of using some of these schema, we might get to the actual substantive yeah. composition about um, what the nature of the remedies should look like in specific cases. Yeah. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you.